and welcome everyone as you're starting to come in this uh, room this morning i want to thank you for your time and taking the time in a weekday to really sit down hear some great keynote speakers for the next two days uh we have nine fantastic companies where we're doing a deep dive into these companies it's not just to be a quick five or ten minute presentation they're going to take their time really go through things and then there's also going to be a q a function at the end of that as well so uh we really highly recommend uh, participating in that being involved in this and and i believe over the next two days uh, everyone's going to learn a lot and potentially find some investment opportunities as well uh, so just to go over a few things before we give it over to Frank Holmes, who's going to be our main speaker. I'll introduce him uh, in just a second as he's on mute there. But just really quickly for everybody, throughout this day, uh, we're going to have uh, nine different webinars or different companies that are going to be going on. And every single time one ends, it will automatically go to the next. You don't have to worry about that. But if for any reason you don't get sent to the next webinar or if you exit out of the, uh, the browser by mistake, I'm going to share something right now. You'll see in the handouts function. I'm going to share this right now that basically will allow you to uh, see each one of our webinars. If you click on that webinar or on that square, it'll bring you right to that landing page. So you'll never get lost throughout this. Really quickly, for those who haven't used this program before as well, in the chat function, I really recommend chatting with a bunch of investors here. You're all here early in the morning, some of you in the afternoon, depending on where you are, to better yourselves or better your company, whatever that is, whatever the reason you're here for. So please, by all means, speak with like-minded investors. If you go into the chat function, you can use that right now. Throw the city that you're in. I saw some of the demographics. It's fantastic where people are coming from. We saw Hong Kong, all throughout the States and Canada, throughout Europe. So uh, try that right now. Throw in the city that you're from. And then also you'll see the Q&A function as well. For our nine companies that are presenting, that Q&A function, you'll put your question in there. Once that company finishes their presentation, we'll then be able to turn to that Q&A and then that executive will start going through that with myself and they'll answer all those questions there for you as well. So I really do hope that everyone enjoys. Uh, the next presentation after this will be Ely Gold Royalties. That's the one you should be looking for right after this. But uh, to introduce Frank, uh, Frank is a, a, one of our keynote speakers in opening up our, our presentation. Uh, Frank has a controlling interest in US global investors since 1989. Uh, he is the CEO and Chief Investment Officer of that company. Uh, he's a go-to investor for seeking exposure to gold, natural resources, emerging markets, and a lot of things through mutual funds as well. In 2006, Frank was selected um, by the Mining Fund Manager of the Year for by the Mining Journal. And in 2011, he was named a U.S. Metals and Mining Top Gun by Brendan Wood International. Uh, his award-winning CEO blog, Frank Talk, is one of the very first to appear in the world of finance, and more than 40,000 investors subscribe to the, uh, his weekly commentary to the Investor Alert newsletter. Frank is a regular commentary on networks such as CNBC, BNN, and Fox uh, Business, and he's also regularly on Kitco News, and he's here for us today to give a little bit of insight. Frank, I'm going to unmute your microphone now and give you the spotlight, my good man. Welcome, and thank you for joining us this morning. Well, it's great to be with you all. And uh, this new medium of uh, presentations uh, over video conferencing uh, is spectacular, uh, where we can all communicate. And, and let's talk about this digital world. And that's my thesis here for investing and try to help investors to understand what's going on. So words, words, words. Uh, we take it for granted that we use Google every day, often many times in a day. Um, and this, this coding of NLP, Natural Language and Processing. I think it came out of Stanford and the idea of identifying words and meanings to it is taken another level in the investment world in the past 10 years, especially with the growth in the cloud, which has facilitated um, so many different businesses booming. Uh, and it's also created the big SaaS model for technology stocks. But for AI, it's allowed the AI world to look at data and look at data for hedge funds uh, to be able to pick stocks and word choice to get feelings. So I think it's so important that you take it for granted when you use Siri, when you use Alexa, but it's real and it's happening all day long in the capital markets. So these sentiment tools are driving the markets, especially from one hour to uh, three days. Uh, a lot of the pivot moves and, and even where I believe we're in a secular bull market in gold, uh, it, within that there are these many big moves that take place, both downdrafts and updrafts, and a lot of it have to do with sentiment tools. And a lot of this stuff has to do with the applications of AI and voice recognition, facial recognition, word recognition, 
press release recognition. So we take for granted when all of a sudden a system can become 90% uh, accurate. And that's what took place with AI for Alexa on word choices of this voice recognition. And now in airport, airports, they've been able to identify like your fingerprint uh, cadence, your walks recognition. Uh, I think this world is totally changing quickly for us, and it's not to be intimidated by it. It's about how you can turn around and think of using some of these tools, such as stock picking with using space satellites, looking at parking lots, seeing the change in the parking lots and the flows of cars, can all of a sudden say, let's go short this stock, or we want to be long this business, uh, from REITs, or from Sears, a lot of the early shorting in Sears was recognizing less cars showing up at all the Sears stores. Uh, and it can also identify uh, the, the average value of a car, which is the value related to the average value of the income of the spenders there. All this that happens in nanoseconds, not weeks of analysis, but I'm talking about seconds, being able to read and download a, a, a 10K and compare it to the past five 10Ks all within two minutes and do financial analysis. This is the new trend. So the magic is what do they look for? And they also look for volatility. This sort of a data sheet is so important for all investors is, and I've written about this often, if you go to usfunds.com and uh, go to uh, the section which we talked about managing expectations. And I love the line by Warren Buffett. He said, if you want to have a long lasting marriage, have low expectations because therefore everything is on the upside. Uh, and in life and in looking at stocks, each stock and each asset class has its own DNA of volatility. This is one of the most important visuals for you to take home to understand that it is a non-event for the S&P to go up or down 1%. It happens almost 70% of the time and over 10 days is plus or minus 3%. Bullion is the same as the S&P. However, most of the talking media heads on Wall Street uh, or around the world say gold is very risky. No, no, cash is risky, as Ray Dalio says. It may not be as volatile, but it's very risky. It's understanding different definitions of risk. Most of the time, it's the volatility is the measure of risk. And I share with you that gold stocks have two to one volatility of overall the bullion. And when we take a look at the airlines, it's almost the same. And we have our Jets ETF and we have our GoAU ETF both listed in New York, and we try to really help investors understand the DNA of volatility. Uh, world, and oil, oil has the biggest volatility. It really is a shocker. And what happens with that is it has a big impact on the airlines industry. And for a while, back going back 15 years ago, it had a big impact on gold production in Africa because the largest cost was oil. Uh, so it, for us as money managers, we're always looking for data and how it can impact a financial statement. And then Bitcoin, one of the favorites people like to talk about, but its DNA of volatility is five times gold. That's what's important for investors to recognize. And you can use it to your advantage. Other factors that are important when you're looking at the how quants, they're looking at these macro forces, such as the trade war and the implications of the trade war. Why? Because America and China are 40% of the global GDP trading. And that's a big factor. Just the same as China, India are 40% of the world's population, therefore massive consumers. And therefore, when we look at the math, the rising GDP per capita in China and India has had a great influence on the demand for gold. And in addition to the airlines industry, before COVID came along, the rise of Chinese tra tourist travel was spectacular. Um, another visual of looking at 40% of the world's population is this cultural affinity both these countries share uh, for gold. And if you go back 30 years ago, they were less than 10% of the demand for gold. And today they're over 50% of the demand for gold. And that's predominantly the love trade. And there were also very significant rising GDP per capita is the rise of the middle class. The rise of the middle class means that you're getting higher consumption of gold for weddings, for, for birthdays. Uh, when you go to China and if it's the year of the tiger, you'll see gold tigers in every uh, jewelry window. So let's talk about gold. 
And let's talk about sentiment analysis and longer term cycles. One of the most important trends is the 50 day moving average versus the 200 day. Short term traders, medium term traders look at this 50 day, which is basically 10 weeks and like to often compare it to longer term, which is 10 months or 200 days. And what we've been seeing now is we've been in a secular bull market, as this visual shows you for gold over 18 months. And gold has fallen below in March, the 50 day, bounced off the 200 day, but the 50 day trend never fell below the 200 day. And this is a classic secular bull market in gold as an asset class. And the big shocker, the big shocker since the year 2000 is bullion is almost five times better performance than gold. I mean, you always hear this gold is risky. Gold's now moved too much shortly. Hey, it, it's, you got to can't own it. Gold falls next week. And then immediately all the talking heads will be, oh, gold's too risky. It's going to crash lower, lower. It's this propensity not to appreciate that gold has outperformed the S&P this year. Gold has outperformed the S&P by a wide margin over the past 20 and a half years. So for investors uh, looking at these trends, it's important to come back that smart billionaire hedge fund managers uh, like Ray Dalio, uh, uh, Paul Tudor Jones, uh, Zam Zell who made his fortune in real estate and Stanley Druckenmiller, they've all been talking about gold and they've been talking about gold in particular, as you can see from this visual, after the 50 day moving average went above the 200 day moving average. But Ray Dalio has always had this cultural, now there's a mathematical appreciation for economic models and owning gold. And at times owning from 7% up to 20%, gold is an asset class to manage, manage off other risks in the capital markets. Uh, so I think that uh, it's, to me, it's fascinating that all these smart guys have been recommending gold. So how complex is gold? Gold is either the love trade, as Elvis and his fabulous uh, gold suit, that, so, that was a trend changer that he, in fact, every other major musical star has turned out with a gold suit uh, to emulate this rock star, the, the king of rock and roll. But it relates to the love trade. And 60% of all gold demand in the world is really for love. What we're dealing with now is the fear. And that's where you get this big delta, this big movement in gold is when you have fear overlapping with the steady, consistent demand for love. So central banks trust the power of gold. And I think it's just interesting. Look at this visual. Uh, so do other uh, uh, stars like Kim, Kim Kardashian, uh, who's made herself famous on social media networks, uh, has been famous for her gold dresses. Uh, but for you, for investors, is to recognize that Indian women own more gold on their bodies and wear more gold than of a magnitude of three times what's in Fort Knox. So what is this fear trade, which is 40% of the demand for gold? It is a binary model. It's monetary or fiscal. And monetary breaks out to another binary. It is either interest rates or money supply. Are interest rates positive or negative? When they're flat or negative, gold rises in that country's currency. Uh, when they're highly positive, gold falls. When gold hit 1900 in 2011, the 10 year government bond had a minus 3% real rate of return. That's why gold went up. Then, then we had the real rate of return turn positive for the US. Gold fell to $1,100. Now it's flat to negative. Money supply, printing of money, it has an impact of currency debasement. And then we have fiscal, tax and regulation and spending. Where's the money being spent and where's it going? So these are important visuals to understand that. But the game changer was just recently when the head of the Federal Reserve, Powell, said that they will act forcibly, proactively, and aggressively. So having a flat, basic zero interest rate environment and have most of the negative real interest rates are in Europe. And when you look at the whole global phenomena of what's taking place, the G20 countries function like a cartel. The finance ministers and the central bankers are working together to fight World War III, the invisible enemy, the coronavirus. And they're all printing money at extraordinary numbers. And this is causing incredible currency debasement, which is showing up in real estate popping. I know in San Antonio, we saw real estate pop 17%, uh, the last data point that came out. 
uh, and we're seeing housing starts take off. Uh, we're seeing unique stocks like Home Depot, where people are stuck at home, all of a sudden verbishing their houses. So the coronavirus has created a, a binary marketplace with the FANG stocks and places where people are stuck at home or fast food. And important has been asset classes like gold and silver and Bitcoin, Ethereum. But most important for this audience is to recognize that, that this quant world is all of a sudden looking at different asset classes and they're looking at gold. So I like to see this visual, which is pretty funny. And I'm going to point out to you that when Greenspan left the Federal Reserve, that the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve is only 6% of the GDP. Today, it's over 30%. So I forecast that the price of gold at 4,000, and it's caught a lot of eyes. I say you don't have to have a, 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 color, a war of weapons. Uh, this is a different type of war. This is the coronavirus war. And there's collaboration of allies all around the world. And they're all printing money. And if we look at the last time the Federal Reserve printed money along with other countries around the world, it took about three years and gold went from seven, 800 level to 1900. If we use this sort of same type of mathematical projection, gold could go to $4,000. That means it's going to grow at about an 18 to 20% compounded growth rate uh, over the next three years. Uh, and that's very feasible because the money printing is at a much greater rate. So the great Warren Buffett, a man with the most profits in his company, a mark to market for all of his investments. However, has missed Amazon, uh, the largest market cap, uh, one of the most profitable companies when you take a look at their growth in revenue, employees and cash flow. Uh, not only are they massive uh, in delivering food today during the coronavirus and products and services, they're huge when it comes to the cloud business. He's missed it. And he's missed gold. And he's missed Bitcoin. But he's always been negative on gold because it doesn't pay a dividend. Well, neither does he. He doesn't pay a dividend. And the currency debasement is much greater than what Berkshire just recently started buying back their stock. Uh, and, and there's some simple math for investors to take a look at uh, when I take a look at gold versus Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, the coronavirus uh, has really impacted his stock much more up to May than bullion. And if you take a look since the year 2000, uh, bullion has outperformed Berkshire Hathaway. But it's OK. It's OK. He's always negative on it as an important asset class. But the, the, the probably the strongest and biggest hedge fund in the world of using a quant approach has been Ray Dalio. And uh, he has uh, used gold as an important asset class to become the largest hedge fund in the world. So this quant world looks at what we've seen this with our airlines, Jets ETF. They look at different things. And what they saw, and we saw this incredible number of investors coming in through Robinhood, uh, the airline industry, what happened after 9-11? Six months later, the airline industry jumped 80%. And after the uh, SARS uh, in Asia, it took, it jumped, the, the jets airline industry jumped uh, 120% over six months. And after the, the global meltdown of 2008-9 in the bottom of March of 9, when Obama, President Obama injected $700 billion into his fiscal stimulus, six months later, the airline industry was up 80%. So what have we seen? We've seen more data coming out to look at the airlines industry. All of a sudden, the TSA is publishing every day how many people they clear. A year ago, they were clearing 2.7 million people. In, in April, it fell down to a low of less than 90,000. Now it's actually over 800,000. The airline industry is now in a big uplift. Uh, we've had the first big surge, correction, and now it appears we're in the second big wave. So there's new data, and we're seeing this with open tables as using the quant world, as using that to pick uh, food stocks, as using uh, this type of data, and secular analysis of looking back at previous cycles. Interesting enough, when uh, the meltdown took place globally, when no flights were really taking place except for healthcare, uh, Anchorage Airport became the busiest during the pandemic. And if you wanted to get physical gold in London, you had to use a private jet. So the cost per ounce of gold surged to $135 an ounce. Now that premium to gold for physical gold has dropped dramatically as airlines are back in business. So we went out and created an ETF three years ago, and it was a quant approach rather than just buying a basket of gold stocks because so many gold stocks did dumb financings that destroyed the value metrics on a per share. The quants are really consumed with the revenue per share, 
that cash flow to, per share, the free cash flow, the highest returns on invested capital on a per share basis, uh, your relative value to enterprise value, looking at all these different factors, your profit margin, your gross profit margin, and how that drives income uh, on a per share basis. A lot of these mergers, they just neglect the valuations on, that are done actually on a per share. They did mergers that actually destroy, the top line looked like it grew in revenue, but the per share basis fell by 40%. You had so many companies issuing shares and that they basically diluted the value factors and the GDXJ by 46%. So we said there's gotta be a smarter way and we created GoAU. And we believe in, this, in the importance of the uh, streaming model and the royalty model. So 30% is based on royalties, royalty companies, the three biggest, and the rest are cherry picking. Every quarter, those companies, those managers that are showing the most attractive metrics on a per share basis, and it's done exactly what it said it would do. This is a, a methodology of really picking gold stocks better, and you have to have the discipline not listening to the narrative of the story, but rather listening to the uh, Luton's law of inertia, uh, calculus, uh, momentum. Is there a momentum on revenue last quarter or four quarters aligned with cash flow last quarter or four quarters? Uh, these stocks outperform. Uh, stocks with free cash flow yields, as I mentioned, and high cash flow returns on invested capital, and having a portfolio structure which is weighted to the royalty companies because that is a superior model, very much like SaaS models in the technology sector. That is, they've the recurring revenue every month, uh, lower volatility than the underlying uh, asset mining companies themselves. So when we take a look at some of these other factors, what we notice is that uh, the gold-silver ratio, and it hit over 100 which is unprecedented because every time gold has made a new high, then all of a sudden that ratio goes back to the long-term median. Well, that's called mean reversion, a very important uh, aspect in the quant world. That is a trending long-term trend can be rising or it can be falling, but the standard deviation moves will surge above and below that long-term trending line. And what we saw on a long-term scale was the gold-silver ratio. Well, gold is surging, that ratio historically always has, has fallen. When that falls, that means silver outperforms gold. And we wrote about it, and we talked about it at usfunds.com on our weekly investor alert, and, and that's what happened. All of a sudden, it fell to 80, and now it's pushing, it's falling to 60. You see this explosion in silver stocks on a relative basis and silver. Um, and we like to see that out of the bottom that took place in March, uh, that uh, picking gold stocks, uh, GoAU far outperformed bullion. I mean, the ratio, as you can see from this data point, even though it's a short term and no past performances guarantee a future results to maintain. But what's interesting to me is that gold stocks far outperformed, and I share why. Why is that? Because the end of March was the first time in over a decade that the universe of the 100 gold producers we follow, their average had a free cash flow yield that was positive. The previous quarter, the previous year, they were always negative as an average. The S&P 500 as a whole had a positive free cash flow yield, but due to the coronavirus, it got wiped out, except for gold stocks and the Amazons of the world and the other sub of fang stocks. They still maintain that free cash flow yield. And gold stocks and Newmont had a free cash flow yield. And I've noticed that the barracks and Newmont are marketing themselves with a free cash flow yield, which means they have the capacity to pay bigger dividends. And we're seeing that. We're seeing those stocks with rising dividends with the rising price of gold are actually getting more buyers. And they're getting non-gold buyers. They're buying, getting the investor business daily newspaper buyers that are growth buyers using quantum mental approach to pick in these stocks. And we go through the IBD 50 biggest stocks and we see over two weeks ago, Franco Nevada, and we see Kirkland Lake uh, all of a sudden populating. We saw that back in 2005 with all of a sudden the generalists were buying the gold stocks because they had stronger metrics on a per share basis 
And I believe that this is the most positive part for the gold stocks in this cycle. As gold rises, gold stocks, I think we're going to outperform bullion. I didn't say this five years ago. I've talked about the value destruction, uh, but gold was always important aspect of your portfolio. Today, I speak with much more confidence, better managers, better uh, interest in protecting those value factors. And it's showing up in these gold stocks. And GoAU has outperformed the GDXJ since we launched it three years ago. And that just goes to show that when you just put money into a market cap bas basket of stocks, you're buying poor stocks with great stocks. What we try to do with GoAU is high grade and only pick those stocks would have the strongest value drivers on a per share basis. And it's outperforms by wide margin. And before we launched this product, that's what our back testing showed. Uh, and we had the conviction the confidence of back testing and spending 8,000 hours before we launched this product. And I'm thrilled to share with you, it's done its work. And as we all know, past performance don't guarantee a future results, but you have to back test and look at the factors before you go out to try to apply them in the real world. Um, and GoAU index, as I said, this back testing approach going back over a decade uh, has shown that it's, it's a better methodology. And maybe these gold mining stocks as an industry whole will change. But I think as gold rises, that there'll be a temptation to grow just at, for the sake of growth. And we'll get the value destruction taking place. But hopefully our model is able to eliminate those and high grade those companies which are showing better factors on a, on a per share basis. And what we've seen was so important. We saw this out of jets. Um, and, and I'm so thrilled about it that we have a, the ecosystem for the capital markets has expanded. A lot of the millennials that were so caught up in this experiencing economy knew everything about travel and knew everything about best hotel deals and they would always spend their surplus income on travel, travel, travel. And all of a sudden we're stuck at home and they became day traders. Then they're using the internet for researching. And we saw tens of thousands come into our Jets ETF as it bottomed for three months. And Buffett came out and said he's out of airlines. And a week later, they took off and they surged over 50%. And something like close to 25,000 of them made a, a great score on that first run. Uh, and I think that that's what's fascinating to me is to see the ecosystem that so much money came through millennials that it was bigger than stock buybacks. And then came the negative news like we see negative on gold uh, that they're all fools. They don't know what they're doing. But I share with you, it's a very different group of people. It reminded me of the 90s with people piling into mutual funds. Uh, this is a much more sophisticated audience. Uh, they use YouTube and listen to podcasts. Uh, and we can see them buying GoAU. And interesting enough, Robinhood has on their toolbar, gold as an asset class. The Schwabs, who announced that they opened 600,000 accounts in March online, and so did TD Waterhouse. Well, they're big, big animals in this space. They don't have gold as an asset class as part of that toolbar. So the Robin Hood is very unique and has this audience of, of uh, active people trading, also taking positions uh, on these stocks and these asset classes. Uh, and so we created that uh, Jets ETF around that same idea. And our bogey was to beat the New York Stock Exchange Global Airlines Index. That's how we back test it and create the factors of spending thousands of hours. And it's done the same thing. We found that cash flow returns on investor capital, uh, gross margins, sales yield, passenger load factor, sales per share growth were important factors in addition to the portfolio construction that the four biggest airlines in America capture something like close to 70% of all air travel. And they started off owning about 48% of the portfolio. It's down to 40%. And what we saw is that most of the small names are foreign. All this stuff, all this back testing allowed us by a quant approach of creating this model to give us what they call a smart beta 2.0. It's not just stock picking, it's the portfolio construction. GoAU focuses on a superior business model of the royalty companies and Jets focus it on the biggest airlines which capture the lion's share of people traveling. Uh, it's done what it said it would do. And I'm thrilled about that. Even, even after its fees, this has outperformed the New York Stock Exchange Global Airline Index. Um, and so here we are is seeing that the world, the smart beta can show up uh, in, in an ETF as well as active in the mutual fund world. 
Uh, and what we saw in the airlines, in particular Jets ETF being the only product, we witnessed for 70 trading days over a billion dollars come in. And Eric Bukhanas talked about this, and I thought it was fascinating to see uh, how millennials were the first mover and then sophisticated hedge funds who were shorting American Airlines and wanted to de-risk their heads by going long jets. There was this Paris trade that was taking place, picking whatever airline they want. They were shorting and using it as a basket. And then we had all of a sudden speculation that we could have an 80 to 100 percent move. And you get all this sort of ecosystem so important for price discovery. You have to have minerals in addition to tunas and sharks and whales and the other squids and, and, and turtles and that whole complete ecosystem uh, that makes uh, the Great Barrier Reef so dynamic and beautiful. We need that in the capital markets. And I'm thrilled to see we're seeing more sophisticated players coming in and using the Internet to trade these various ETFs. Uh, as you see here in this visual, uh, that we had 70 straight days of inflows. So buying totally contrarian. It's unprecedented that an ETF would fall by 50% and then a billion dollars would come in uh, playing that bottom and people had done the research of what took place in previous cycles. Uh, what we also noticed is, is, the, is the big difference, as you can see here, uh, Buffett sells his airlines and it seems that a lot of the Robin Hood investors were buyers of them uh, before they took off. Uh, and they have a complete different view. And now we're seeing that in cruise lines today, uh, talking about that the uh, bookings were up dramatically. But for investors, there's new data points. Uh, the quants are using the TSA, as I mentioned earlier, and open tables as a metric to look at fast food restaurants, looking at word choice. We have seen how words in a press release can knock a stock what used to take in the gold space two weeks to fall 27% because of uh, a property difficulty with the property or, or EPA problem at the property. Uh, these stocks would fall over two weeks. It now happens in two hours. Immediately, these stocks are being shorted. And then all of a sudden, the quant funds are covering. Other people are trying to buy. That's a cheap buy. But I think that uh, it's for you to recognize that the quants are looking at word choices. And there are patterns. So they go back and look at what word choices saw stocks go up, what word choices saw stocks go down. And as a simple model we found with the gold space is that we went back over a decade and give us the 100 stocks who had the strongest revenue per share and who had the worst revenue per share and looked at those stock performance. And the bifurcation was so great that it told us that quants look at revenue per share growth. They're merely going to have shorting stocks that could hurt that revenue per share growth. And if you're, and gold is rising, it doesn't matter. Those stocks will still get harmed uh, versus those stocks in a bear market uh, for gold falling. But those stocks showing the strongest growth in revenue per share fall less. And then on any upturn in the price of gold, they rise further. So that is an important metric in the world of quant investing as applies to gold, it applies to the airlines. And I think it's important for investors to recognize, go back in previous cycles, look at what the probability is. How many months does it take to make this type of tactical trade? Do you have the patience for it? And do you have the stomach for the short term volatility? In that spectacular run of SARS, where after SARS was over and the airlines jumped 120% in six months, there were three big corrections of over 10%. Do you have that ability to stomach that volatility in that run? I hope that this presentation helps you to understand how the quants are changing the world, uh, how they're looking at stocks and data and information, and that you yourself recognize these long-term 50-day above the 200-day like the stock market and like gold. Therefore, trade around that secular rising market. Happy investing.